Hello there, friends. It's Nick here from the Grayscale Gorilla Podcast. And before we get started today, I wanted to let you know that we're about to launch Grayscale Gorilla Plus. It's all of our training in one place for one affordable price per month. So go check that out over at grayscalegorilla.com slash plus. Put yourself on the list because we're about to launch this dude. We can't wait to show you what's in here. Now, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about bumping the lamp, navigating unrealistic expectations, especially from those clients out there. And speaking of clients, we talk about how to make your clients happy and still have a life. I'm done talking. Without any further ado, let's get into today's episode. Well, hello there, render friends. It's Nick here again from the Great Skill Gorilla Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with me today is Michael Marr. How are you, sir? I'm doing swell. And uh, of course, Chad Ashley, how is how is today treating you? Today is treating me very well. Thanks. <laughs> oh man, very that's well. not that's not good. I'm gonna reach for my coffee. I had a dentist appointment and couldn't drink anything, and now I'm I'm ready to go. I I need two more coffees today, and I'll be all set to go. Uh, we got uh, we got some fun stuff to talk about today. We got some news. We got. Uh, Gosh, so many things happening around here. But um, let's. Uh, what's going on in the industry lately, here, Chad? Don't you? What's going on in the news? Well, the news. Uh, I guess the not a lot, whole lot has happened between now and the last show. But there was some sad news. Uh, beloved animation director uh, Richard Williams passed away at eighty six, and uh, I think those of you might know him. Uh, for his huge role in uh, Roger Rabbit, he was the animation director for Roger Rabbit. But I'll be—I'll bet more people know him from his his book on animation called *The Animator Survival Kit*, which I think is probably on everybody's shelf that's listening to this. And if it's not, you should go pick it up. But it should be now. I've yeah. seen this in every studio so many times. I've seen this in every studio. I had to get my own copy and. It is really, um, that's an amazing book. Yeah, think about how someone like, like, like Richard Williams, who like influenced so many people, and just think about the effect that his teaching and his talent and his devotion like has given to the industry. And it's, it's pretty humbling to think about that, to think about all the people that may have read that book and got inspired or figured something out or watched Roger Rabbit or, uh, I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to look at his other films, but I'm sure he's done other amazing stuff. Right. Mike, you probably know. Yeah. He did a few title sequences that I recall, like, um, not the, not the original pink Panther, but I think he did the second and third one, like the return of the pink Panther and pink Panther strikes again. I think he did both of those. So like, I think more people know those films for, the actual animated cartoon Pink Panther than some of the actual parts of the movie itself. Right. Yeah. I'm looking at his uh, IMDB right now and the Pink Panther. Yep. For sure. That was a, those are actually really funny. I remember, do you remember the Pink Panther cartoon? Oh yeah. Or was that what, like those were, those came out way after too. Yeah. And they had like, I don't know. There's something about the color palettes they used, which are really always, uh, I love those things like really muted, almost pastel late sixties kind of color palettes, which are really fun. But yeah, so that, that's, uh, that, that conversation and just talking about his work, uh, Mike and I were chatting and he was talking about this idea that was born from the movie, Roger Rabbit, or I guess it's uh is it an idea? It's more of like a, it's kind like of a slang like, term. It's kind of become a mantra, or it, it was at least. I, I don't know if it's still used heavily, but um, uh, if anybody's seen Roger Rabbit, there's this this scene that anybody listening to this podcast will know what I'm talking about. But if you try to explain it to anybody outside of this world, they're like, "What? What are you talking about?" But there's a scene when um, Eddie goes to the bar, and he and Roger Rabbit are handcuffed together, and they need to get the handcuffs off. And so they go into the back of the bar, and the first thing that happens is Eddie, who is is the guy, Eddie's the man, he walks into the, there's a hanging lamp, and he bumps the lamp with his head, and the lamp starts swinging around the room. And obviously what happens is the light starts moving around the room, so you see the light 
rotating around the room, lighting the character, going off the character, lighting the character again. And what they ended up doing after the film is when they drew the characters in. So when they're drawing Roger Rabbit into the scene, they actually shaded him as the light was moving around him as well. And so they went through an incredible amount of work to get like the light shining on Roger the way that it hit Eddie as it rotates around the room. It's one of those things nobody will notice unless you are kind of like a nerd like us where you love <laughs> these kind of little details. But, <laughs> you know, I, I could probably go ask my mom if she remembers that scene and she's just going to be like, that's the one with the girl, right? With the big with Jessica <laughs> Rabbit. I'm like, yep, that's the movie. <laughs> I'm watching the yeah. scene now, so I pulled it up on YouTube, and I'll, we'll put in the links here. Um, but it's one of those things you don't notice until somebody points it out. I mean, it's it's such a part of the scene. Look at that; oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a it's basically a really cool flex. <laughs> <laughs> so so what is that? So what it, when you use that term, does that mean like you're 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 putting this project on expert mode? Like you just bumped the lamp? Like you just moved the camera in a green in in like a compositing scene? Like is is that is that kind of what that means? Like you're you're yeah, making it, it harder? Yeah, it's one of those details that it's kind of like you're doing so much more work than is expected of you. Because there was even like a thing that happened after the movie came out where um, I'm trying to remember who was in charge at Disney at the time. It might have been Eisner um, where he was like doing a presentation and he specifically brought up bumping the lamp and like mentioning our animators go the extra, you know, work extra hard to get these little details like this. And, you know, they have true dedication to their craft. And right. then that just kind of got more people to want to do those extra little details, which honestly, that that goes on till today, especially in all of Disney's films, Pixar films. They go through incredible amount of details that most people will never even notice. I feel right. like Pixar is definitely famous for that, like like just going so above and beyond. Um, yeah, Pixar's yeah. whole thing with that is like, you know, we – There'll be a, a dresser in Andy's bedroom, right? And you'll never see that dresser get opened. You'll never see that anybody reach into that dresser for anything. But if you are in the shot and you, you know, you're in the scene file and you open up that dresser, there's gonna be socks in there. There's gonna be textures on the inside of the dresser. There's gonna be folded shirts. That's their whole thing. You know, they just they do they don't shortchange anything. And and that was like when I think about this bumping the lamp, I immediately think of of course Disney and and Pixar for their ability to and just like dedication to like just everything. Everything is thought about, everything is planned, everything is made. It's insane. It's funny that you mentioned that because I'm I'm looking at my bookshelf right now and I see the animator survival kit and right next to it is Creativity Inc. And then I've just got oh, some yeah. other like cinematography books and things like that. But yeah, those 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 two companies had a huge influence on me. Yeah, for those of you that aren't familiar, Creativity Inc. is a book by Ed Catmull, who uh, ran. Uh, he might still be running Pixar. I think I, he I just. To... I think he just left. Okay, yeah. yeah. So he he was um, responsible for their formative years, and uh, there's some really great insights in there. And talking about uh, one thing that always stuck with me in that book was the idea of quality is the best business plan. And I really believe that to be true. And, and I think that that's what bumping the lamp is sort of about. It's about going that extra mile, doing, doing things that are uh, quality, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Oh, I did a little uh, JFK quote there. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> <laughs> we do the things because they are hard. <laughs> I'm not going to even try to go any further than that. Well, there's, but, yeah. there's this... Um... This way of looking at 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 work and and business that I, that I've thought a lot about, which is there's often less competition. The more the harder you work at things, and the more complex you try to make them, and the more ambitious the goal, there's often less competition and less people trying to pull that off, and you stand out so much because um, because the quality is so clearly above where everything else is and 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 yeah def definitely disney pixar um 
may, maybe Apple, <laughs> we'll, we'll see as they move forward. But um, so those companies that just go above and beyond to make the experience and the, the, um, the feeling of it right, regardless right. of, of, of if most people notice or not. It's like those 5%, 2% of the people that really actually notice it are, are who they're talking to, and the rest of the people will just watch it or use it. It's very interesting. I think the love comes through, you know, like that's what people are attracted to. They're attracted when you love something and you put as much care to make Roger Rabbit look like he's sitting in the scene and the light is dipping in and dipping out. That is a labor of love that just adds to the experience. Now, whether or not people, the you know, regular folk can even distinguish what's different about the scene than if somebody sort of took a shortcut with it who's to say, but I do think it contributes to the, to the emotion of the scene. And just like you feel the love. Did you, did you ever actually watch the like knockoff Roger Rabbit movie with Brad Pitt? Oh my God. Yeah. Remember that? I think it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was like cool. It was world Ralph, or something like so that, that. Yeah. It was called cool world. And it was directed by Ralph Bakshi. Who's actually done some amazing animation. But that was not that was not one of them. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, this looks awful. <laughs> it's like it's a straight up Roger Rabbit knockoff with like a, a voluptuous female uh, uh, animated but no, character, but with no shadows. <laughs> they're drawn. She's just they're floating. Like stickers. <laughs> yeah, she's floating on the screen. She's like attached to the camera and just kind of like moves around. And Brad, oh, yeah, Brad Pitt's just kind of uh... standing in the background the whole time. Oh, that's bad. Well, Ralph Bakshi, I think, is probably, uh, he's an amazing storyteller, and I actually really like his early his early uh, animation work, because it was kind of pushing the boundaries of animation, did a lot of like really adult-themed stuff with Fritz the Cat and stuff like that, and I think he did Lord of the Rings and stuff. Oh, I like but, Fritz the Cat. Yeah, it's like super weird, trippy stuff, and I think had Cool World tried to like go more into like the drug culture it would have been way better and i would have it would have been way easier to forgive some of its shortcomings but yeah dude like that was just full on yeah just not good there's no they didn't they didn't let's just say they didn't bump any lamps on this movie. <laughs> that's right uh more more jumping the sharks i would say yeah that could be true that could be true that's amazing. I, that movie um, is one I, I – Roger Rabbit I'm talking about. I probably only see it maybe every five years, and I f always forget how much I love that movie every time I watch it. There's uh, there's like no slow parts. There's there's – every scene is like a memorable set. Like I remember – like as they set up the scene, I'm like, oh, this is that part. Every, and that's like – it's like Jurassic Park in that way where every scene has this memorable feeling about it. Um, God, I love – now you're just making me want to go watch Roger Rabbit again. I mean, Putting it in the really notes. Good. We'll never see something like that again. Like it's kind of a bummer, but it's going to be – it'll be – pretty hard to convince a major studio to one do traditional hand-drawn animation again and we also had the crossover of properties you had disney you had warner brothers you had like everybody in this movie it was it was huge yeah the licensing and all the negotiations that must have taken place to get all those characters on the screen together must have been insane that's but crazy. yeah, I re I've remember watching it being like, oh my God, how did they get Disney characters to show on the screen the same way Warner Brothers like that? I think even like, I want to say Popeye shows up for a bit, like does a cameo. I could be wrong. But I was just, just young enough to where it just made it. sense to me. I was like, yeah, of course. That's where all the cartoons live, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. No, what? No, duh. Like Mickey Mouse is hanging out, you know, with, uh, with Bugs Bunny. But then as I got into animation and as I got older, I'm like, wow, that's, that's quite the room full of lawyers. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> like if you, happening. if you, next time right. you rewatch the movie, you'll notice that, uh, I think the scenes Bugs Bunny and, and Mickey Mouse are parachuting, right? They're jumping, they're parachuting together. They're on the screen at the exact same time together for the exact same time. Like, there that one couldn't be uh, in for like a frame more than the other like that's how wow. detail <laughs> specific God. the contracts were 
Well, you don't want to you don't want to mess with Daffy Duck, man. He's his agent is a real hard ass. <laughs> oh man, that Daffy <laughs> Duck, Donald Duck piano yeah. duel, piano, like, yeah, so great. Like, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, there's so many moments in that movie. I'm gonna have to rewatch it now, just for That's so just good. To, just to say that you know, I love the scenes too when they're doing the dip, you know, and they're like erasing the characters and. Uh, who's the guy that oh, plays yeah. the the evil dude? What's that was uh, name? Christopher Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd, yes, yes. And this he was, was well, this so was also good. this was Robert Zemeckis. So they had literally just finished Back to the Future one, and then oh, they, right. they started working on this film. Right? Yeah, I forgot about. And he's it. like, I'll just do this that. weird little side project <laughs> between between uh, uh, Back to the Future one and two. It'll be fine. Yep. <laughs> Wow. And get this. All right, it's on the list. Crazy, crazy stuff, man. Yeah, so let's talk more about bumping the lamp because I think that's a really interesting topic in that you've got the one side of it, which is going the extra mile and, and putting all your energy and love into something to make it extra special. But then you've got the other side of it, right? You've got the side of it that's like, I had no idea that bumping a lamp was going to trigger this much work for right. now oh. gonna be i'm like on set you know they're probably like yeah we'll have the lamp you know move around it'll be very noir and it'll look great and at the time maybe they thought about it and maybe they planned it but i kind of imagine this this scenario playing out where they're like yeah that'll look great and then there's some poor animator maybe uh maybe richard williams who was like oh god you had to move the light like are you kidding me i think there's like there's i think the story was it wasn't originally supposed to move um but they realized when they were on set that it would be funnier if eddie kept hitting his head on the lamp like they just thought it would be really funny if he did this and so they just right. determined that on set because you have to remember with the movie all of the live action stuff was shot at least a year ahead of the animation and so yeah. they they filmed it on set, and I think they realized, oh, it's even funnier if he keeps hitting this lamp. And then they just like, all right, uh, good luck, guys. Uh, there's a there's a scene in there you're gonna love us for, and uh, Richard and your team have fun with that. Do you think they shot it both ways? Um, I don't know. I, I remember reading a story. I'll, I'll have to see if I can find it, and we'll put it in the show notes. But I remember reading an interview with with some of the animators that. Um, once it got to them, like that scene, that scene had already been determined that the lamp was going to be moving. Right. Yeah. I just imagine on set if they were like, well, for safety, let's go ahead and shoot this without bumping the lamp <laughs> and knowing the full well <laughs> that they would never use it, but they just wanted to, you know, make everybody feel okay at the moment. Well, Chad, you've worked, um, I know a lot of pre-production that where, where you were filming live action to then add 3d and or special effects or or stuff in post what what have you bumped into that maybe a director or, or somebody on the set was like hey let's bump the lamp and and you have to make that call of of how much more work it is and if it it's if it's worth the effect you know right well i kind of equate shooting for you just shooting live action in general or just shooting live action for vfx or motion design even is a lot like getting your house remodeled and i didn't really have any idea what it was like to be a client until i had my kitchen redone and i know that sounds weird but bear with me so the idea of the reason that i felt that way is because when i'm having my kitchen redone i know nothing about redoing a kitchen. I know nothing about construction. I don't, I don't know anything about doing those sorts of things. So throughout the process, I would notice things and I would walk up to one of the contractors and be like, Hey, uh, I noticed there's like a little tape right here. And is that, are we going to be able to like do something with that? And they would every time be very patient and say, oh yeah, well, don't worry. That's all going to be taken care of later in the process and everything will be fine. Like that'll be moved. That'll be painted over. Don't worry. And I, after like the second or third day of, of the construction, I was like, oh my God, this is what it feels like to be a client on set. <laughs> and like, cause you, you don't know and everything is like potentially going to cost you money and you want it done right. And so you, it was, it was like a, just a complete 
like like epiphany that I had. I was like, oh my God, I'm a client. This is terrible. <laughs> and so I sat back and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to trust that they know what they're doing and I'm not going to like nitpick every detail. And I'll tell them, please let me know when you want my notes and I will jump in and let you know what I, and tell me what I should react to. I was trying to like be what I would have considered to be a good client on set. But getting back to your point, there are things that a client on set is going to think of that to them, that seems like a very important, dangerous change, or uh, it could potentially, they might think that it's a no big deal change, but they don't know the cons. They don't know what that means. They don't know how to say, well, if I change this little thing, is that a, is that a big change or a little change? So I've had situations where clients will think they're asking for something that's completely ridiculous and going to screw up the entire day of shooting and put us behind when it's actually super simple. And then I've had the flip flop of that where they're like, oh, we just want to, uh, I don't know, change this one little thing. And it's got a, a, we've already shot like five other shots with that thing in it. And now what do we do now? And there's, so it's sort of like a mixed bag. Like you, you, you really, really don't know. Uh, what kind of change is going to come through, but it's just about being able to communicate the consequence of bumping that lamp, right? It's about like saying, and hopefully, you know, them wanting to bump the lamp is like a real, I'm just going to keep saying that, by the way, it's kind of fun to say. That's, that's uh, a, it, it's good. But if you, if they have like a really, like if it's a very uh, minuscule thing, then you can be the hero and you could say, yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. We'll totally, we'll totally change that thing and and make that over here, and uh, no problem. And just be really gracious. And if they if they bump the lap in a serious way, that's going to cause you to have to like paint Roger Rabbit, you know, every basically the entire shot just changing the lighting, and it's a it's something that's going to really screw up the the timeline. Then the answer is always yes. But. But. The answer is always yes with a but. And that but is really important. And this is where having a producer right next to you is like really helpful because you can play good good cop, bad cop. Because you don't want to ever be the director or the creative who's the naysayer. You want to be the, the partner to the agency creative that's like excited to do this work and not always saying, well, that's going to be too expensive. So you can say, yeah, I think we could totally do that. Let me just check how that might impact the schedule or the budget with a producer and we'll get back to you or they'll get back to you and we'll, we'll try to figure something out. And then usually um, if it's a change order that that's like major or they're tweaking something on set that's major and it's really going to uh, put us behind, usually money talks. Like if it affects the budget, then that is definitely, they're going to think twice about actually right. wanting you to do that thing. Yeah, absolutely. We could do that. And it, uh, it'll just be a month later and, uh, right. you know, well, hundred grand extra. Time is not necessarily something that they will uh, balk at as much because to them, we can figure that out. Oh, it's going to take two more weeks. We'll just hire two more people. Like, what's your problem? Go do it. And so time isn't always the best uh, negotiating tactic unless time is of the essence and this thing is due like a, a rush, like maybe it's due in two weeks or a week or something like that. Then you can use the time the time argument because you can just be like, there simply is not enough physical time to do this. But more often than not, money is the thing that would always get them to really consider how much they want that tweak or how much they want to bump that lamp. Yeah. It reminds me a little of, I think what we talked about last week as well, which is that boss that asks the, the soul or one of the only, um, 3D people in the team to do something really complex. And they have, they really don't have either of those levers to pull other than time, which, like you said, is like, yeah, take as much time as you want. Just, you know, go remake Lord of the Rings with our logo. And not having those other levers to pull, like, like, yeah, it'll cost you more money because your salary. Um, and right. so, you know, that that's probably still on our list of discussions to have and try to try to kind of figure that side out. But when you're when you're on set, what are the things um, that you're what are the red flags for you uh, when a client has an idea or something's in the script where you're like, oh, gosh, this is going to be a nightmare <laughs> in post? Uh, yeah, I've learned the hard way that 
plan you can't plan enough you can't over plan uh, uh, anything to do with live action and I would meticulously board and sometimes even do a uh, full previs of my, my own previs that I might not even show anybody, but the AD and really plan it all out. So there was little to no gotchas on set, but I, I think you just have to try to roll with it. And you got to remember that for as much planning that you put into it, you got to be open to the day, which is really important because you never know what might happen on set that might trigger a better idea. And yeah, it might be more work and yeah, it might require the team back at the studio to like want to punch you in the face because you, you did this in a certain way, but only you on set can really understand why that's important to make those decisions on the day. For instance, like trying to think of a, of a, uh, a for instance here. Okay. So I was, before I started directing live action, I was actually doing VFX souping on a director that we had on staff, Eric, Eric Anderson. We, we've mentioned him before on the show. And I was fairly new to like live action VFX souping. And he was shooting a beer commercial that was kind of run and gun. It was a lot, a lot of setups in a day uh, and just a lot of moving around. And the entire spot was going to require hovering sort of like this is back when um what's that movie that had like the 3d type panic room remember the panic room titles that oh, everybody yeah. wanted yeah. to do so everybody wanted to do these panic room titles at that time and this beer commercial was no different so my job was to be on set to make sure that we could track in these titles into these shots right and i was so new that i didn't really know how to say no to eric and I just knew that if I was the guy who was always telling Eric what he couldn't shoot and how he had to shoot it, that I would be the pariah and I would never get asked back to do another VFX soup again. And it would just be, it would be bad for me. So I tried to, on the fly, think of ways to make things work. And for instance, so he's shooting this like macro shot of a beer glass on a bar top. And it's like super, uh, it was like a really long lens, very shallow depth of field. Everything was blown out of focus, like two inches behind the glass and two inches in front of the glass and typical Eric Anderson kind of shot. And so I'm there going like, oh my God, like I have to track and it's handheld. And it's like, I got to track a title next to this glass with nothing to track. And I can't lay tracking markers down because all the, you know, you and everybody else back in the studio would be like, oh my God, I got to paint out all these tracking markers. Why did you do this? <laughs> so while I'm on set looking through the monitor, I notice that the the bar top surface is imperfect. There's like dust on it. There's like, you know, it's a it's an old bar. And so what's happening is the light's hitting these little dust particles and making little bokeh balls, like really tiny, sharp, white bokeh balls all on the bar top. And I'm like, oh man, this gives me an idea. So I run over to the craft service table and I grab a napkin and I start tearing the napkin into as tiny a pieces as I can get it. And I roll them into tiny, tiny, tiny specks, little balls. And I walk on set and I'm like, everybody's expecting me to drop tracking markers. And I just start sprinkling this like napkin powder dust all over the he's bar lost top. it <laughs> and she, dude they seriously were like what in the hell is this guy doing and even eric was like uh what are you what are you doing man i'm like trust me these things are gonna track like th these are our tracking markers and we're not even gonna paint them out and so i dropped him in there and sure enough the light hit him they, you know, they, they looked beautiful because it looked like this natural, like dust patina on the bar top and they tracked perfectly. And so I guess the point of my story is be flexible, be creative, but when things get too gnarly, you got to step up and be like, yo, this is going to kill the entire team. We can't do this. So yeah, that's my little story about you just, you reminded me of something, um, so I don't know if anybody's uh, is familiar with with David F. Sandberg. He's uh, he's one of like these horror directors who came up doing like he did uh, Lights Out and he did one of the Annabelle movies. And he's also had a YouTube channel where he's done like DIY filmmaking tips and things like that. 
And I've always enjoyed learning from him, like, you know, building DIY dollies and cool stuff like that. And so he went on to direct Shazam. And so mm. he actually came out with a video essay a few months ago that was just an incredible dive into like the actual problem solving that you face on a major motion, mo motion picture where, you know, you're realizing you have you don't have a character on set one day and they need to come from inside the house and meet up with the other characters and like how you have to match costumes and all these little things you never think about. Now it, and it takes like a whole team to get these tiny things. And then people still complain. You're like, well, why did they all put their jackets on to go outside and go back in? And then, but he then like breaks it down. It's like, this is why we did this. And this is how we did this. And even, uh, cool little tricks. Like they, you know, they were shooting in the mall. There's like a flying sequence in a mall and uh, there were some crew that were in the shot. Like, uh, I don't remember if they're holding gear or whatever, but they ended up just like, they couldn't paint them out because they only had like a very short window to deliver that shot. So they just uh, comped like shopping bags into their hands and stuff like that. But it's a really Brilliant. cool vibe. Yeah, I'll put that, I'll put that in the show notes as well, but it's a really cool uh, video on how they solve all these little issues like that you, that you never think about. Yeah, I feel like, when you're doing that job, whether you're FX souping, directing, just live action in general, problem solving is everything. Like you don't know. I would bring stuff that I shot back to the studio and somebody comping it would like complain or whatever. And you, if you don't know the story, you can damn well be sure that everything that came back in the live action was there was if there's a problem, there's a story behind it. Right. And there was a decision that was made or uh, something that had to be cut due to time or, you know, pick your pick your reason. But it's never it's usually never for lack of uh, of skill. Like it's not usually a mistake. It's usually like, oh, man, like this was <laughs> this is why this happened. You know, so it, who knows the reason. But, yeah, you just got to be roll with the punches and like really kind of problem solve your way through it right i think i think there's even you know people listening to this that you know forget that sometimes you don't have time to bump the lamp and so you have to think of ways to cheat or like you know maybe move the camera or you know something there's a weird cut so you try to hide a jump cut or something like that um you just have to be creative in solving those problems you're not it's never going to be perfect. You're, you're never going to have no. that final product that's exactly how you storyboarded it. And as long as you deliver something and your client's happy, it doesn't matter. Somebody might find an imperfection, but who cares? You still got paid and you can move on to the next project. <laughs> this kind of just... goes against our mythos, doesn't it, there, Mike? <laughs> there's, hey, man. There's, there's really um, simple things, too, that I that weren't obvious to me that once somebody tells you, you're like, oh, of course that's how you do it. And one of them was like um, trying to film green screen or, or even just knowing that you're going to add something to the shot later that you want to, if possible, just lock that dang camera off. Oh my God, yes. And make the, even if you're in the middle of an action sequence and you're going to add all this camera shake and all these, you know, vibration effects and flip the camera around, do all this stuff, lock the dude off, make, make the um record what you need and then there's minimal tracking right if you're adding something to the background you're adding castles or mountains or explosions or whatever you just do it all in the scene it's going to look ridiculous without all the camera shake that you're going to add later <laughs> and once somebody told me that like block it off and then add the camera shake later it was one of those like inception moments where I was like, oh, of course, that's how you do it. That's the movie magic everyone's been talking about. It's like it's like in in uh, in Star Trek when they all just make them move around the set <laughs> instead right. of, you know, like they, they shake the camera and make them move around the set instead of shaking the whole dang airplane. So those those I little that battle so many times. <laughs> Well, and even even I thought I was extra smart. I was like, well, yeah, but then the camera shake won't be natural and it'll look like computer generated. If I just throw a vibrate tag on my camera in After Effects, it's not going to look as natural as if we do it in hand. And of course, there's an answer to that too, which is that's fine. Go hand hold um, doing a camera move on tracking paper, like go film tracking paper and do the camera move. 
and then track that, you know, track those X's on the screen and then add the move in later. That way it's a real natural camera move. And I was like, oh, of course, like all these problems have been, have been brought up and, and been trying to solve, people have been trying to solve these problems for like a hundred years plus now, right? And in the digital world and for, for like 40, 50 years now, trying to figure this out. And, uh, and, and thinking just those little things, and I'm sure there's more of them. You might, you might have one in your head, put it in the comments. <laughs> Cause I love these little tricks that people use that, that are kind of obvious once you hear them. But, but, um, if you don't know them, you can get into a world of, of, uh, removing tracking markers and green screen problems and all these issues. If you don't stabilizing think about shots, it. stabilizing shots. I remember, yeah. dude, I would have so many arguments with DPs on set that just wanted a little bit of movement in the frame. And I'd be like, dude, you're literally adding hours of work needlessly. We can do that exact move in, you know, back at the studio. But then I sort of thought about it and I was like, well, of course, the DP wants to do that. Like if he just set up lock offs all day, like he feels like he's not contributing right? or he or she feels like they're not doing their job or they might not get asked back. Like all they did is set it up on a tripod and walk away. So I get it that they want to feel like they're contributing and doing something. But at the end of the day, uh, if, if you're the production company that, that hired the DP or you're on set and you're like, Oh man, this is going to all this like, subtle handheld stuff is costing us a lot of money in stabilization then yeah you got to speak up but yeah, i do i remember having those arguments like constantly <laughs> all right i want to get a list together now all right let me see your <laughs> comments folks drop them in the if you're listening on youtube and, and by the way um let us know too if you're listening on itunes uh i know it's a little meta break in the middle of this podcast here but now that we're doing more of these shows we'd love to hear where you're listening from uh, and say hi. So if you're listening on iTunes or anywhere over there, leave us a comment. Say hi. Tell us um, what what your favorite Zemeckis movie is. <laughs> oh, back to the there future. You go. Duh. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're also uh, on Spotify now, too, by the way. I don't know if I've told you guys that, but we're, we're yeah. everywhere. Your, your podcast can be streamed on your favorite podcast streaming service. Wow. Yeah, I feel like uh, there's so many more places that you can get them now. Like it's crazy. Like there's uh, like a million apps and a million spots now. If we're not in your favorite spot, let us know. Yep. Uh, we will add it. Adorable. Well, um, what else we have on our list today? And then we're approaching for ooh, almost 40 minutes. We'll, uh, anything else on the list we can get into? I know we've been busy behind the scenes on a bunch of stuff. Uh, that we'll, I'm sure, announce sooner or later. But um, what what else been going on? Hmm. Mike, what do you got? Well, I've got uh, product releases out the wazoo, guys. So I think I think every <laughs> time we go to a show, I realize somebody comes up to us and mentions like, "You guys have been really quiet for a while." I was like, "Yeah." They're like, "Does that mean you have a lot of stuff about to come out?" And we're like, "Yeah." <laughs> so yeah. We. Uh, <laughs> I, I, Anybody who's heard about Grayscale Gorilla Plus over the past few episodes and past few weeks, um, we we have launched a, an early bird version of that, which is, is closed off now. But the full version of that comes out here pretty soon. We have a new collection of Happy Toolbox models that will be up in the store uh, probably in another week or so. And so we've got that coming out. We teased a new material collection. So if you follow us on uh, Instagram or Twitter, you can check out some previews as well as some artists who have already demoed. There's some really, really neat stuff from um, James Owen and Billy Chitkin and uh, Zach Corzine. They've all kind of shared some stuff on their channels that you can kind of maybe start piecing together what this new pack is. But I'm super excited about that. I know Chad is definitely excited about that. <laughs> Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they look, they yeah, look amazing. Percent. I'm excited to play out the, the the everyday material pack's been um like my most used thing in the last year. Mostly because you know I'm into Redshift, playing around with it, and I have almost zero interest in learning <laughs> Redshift uh, node materials. That's just not how my brain works. So now that that I am able to like go in this library 
build my scene out with this stuff. Such a huge help. And then when I do need to customize it, I don't have to start from scratch. It's all there. That, that thing's been good. So I'm really excited about the new pack. I got a little sneak peek of it, and it's going to be fun. I'm, yeah, I'm it's going to be good. I'm excited about it, too. Yeah, yeah but a, on that on that tip, like I feel that way too about some software. Like I tried to uh I tried to open Houdini yesterday. <gasps> and, uh, done. Uh, I, I was like, dun, Yeah, dun, dun. this I need more time with this. This is maybe not the right Uh-oh. thing for me, but <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much sums it up right oh, there. No. I was like I was messing around with it and I was like, oh my God, I need, I need somebody to teach me this. Like, this is like, I can't do this on my own. So yeah, (laughs) it's, it's like, it's crazy. Like you thought that like the redshift notes were, were crazy, man. Like that thing is like, whoo, I I went running tail between my legs back to substance. (laughs) Like, (laughs) like, yay, yay, yay. Just petting your shit. Like, yeah, like a dog that like hit the electric fence or something. <laughs> Chad's in the corner petting a shader ball. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's all right. It's okay. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> we're, we're all fine. Uh, yeah. Mike, I gotta say, Mike gets like um like a like one coupon per um per um, episode <laughs> for for sound effects, and I th- I think you you played it well, my friend. Oh, thank you. Was, was I like good. that idea. I think yeah, I love the idea that he gets one sound effect <laughs> per podcast. <laughs> you never know when it's gonna happen. It's gonna pop and up. You got to stick around to hear how he's gonna work it in. <laughs> how's it gonna How's it gonna move it into this? Oh, and there it is. Yeah. Oh. So there you go. There's your little uh, Easter egg thing right there. We're finally getting to put this uh, radio television film degree to work <laughs> there you go nice just hit, hit, hitting them buttons hey before um before we roll out i have a like a concept that i i, I want to run past you i think i maybe talked about it in the last episode a little bit i think there's something here and you tell me what what's missing on it so i'm thinking about these these artists out there like we talked about last week that have it, their 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 creative director or their boss kind of have an unlimited budget of what they're able to tell them what to do. And there's, there seems to be no way to say, I can't do that. Right. They're, they're kind of in the same position you were with, with Eric, where it's like, I can't continuously tell my boss, I, that what you're asking is very hard. And I can't continuously tell my boss that I can't do it because he hired me to do this. But in many cases, as we know, uninformed clients, just like you might've been with your kitchen, Chad, uninformed bosses or clients are asking for things that are just like impossible or uh, take teams of thousands or hundreds of people, you know, years to pull off. And so I had this thought, like, what if there's some sort of like, like dollar system, like, like monopoly money or something like some that, that represent basically the hours that something takes to do. And then every, for every time you have an idea, every time the the every time the creative director walks by with an awesome idea, and by the way, uh, just to be clear, these are these are a lot of our uh, teams we're talking with. They're not doing production work in the field where they're get where where like outside money is coming in. This is often in house work, where. Uh, from what I'm hearing, the boss or the creative director, somebody on the team saw something cool yesterday on the Spider-Man movie and they walk in and they're like, we need our logo with all the webs around it. And then it comes down and then it knocks over this and then it does this. And here's the 3D artist going like, yeah, that's cool. But <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> but I can't do that. And, and and I know I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I know that we got enough feedback from people that are like, yeah, you're describing my my day. So I'm 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 tossing this idea out just to try to solve it. I don't think this is quite it, but what if there was like literally like eight, you know, eight monopoly dollars or eight hundred monopoly dollars per day per per and then essentially 40 monopoly dollars per week that represent your hours at work and you have ideas all you want. And then you're, you're coming back to your boss to be like, awesome idea. Just like you said, of course, boss, of course, I'm going to do that. Here's how many, here's how many monopoly hours this will, will take to do. Do you want me to go research this and do it? Or maybe even help, maybe have higher help or do this. Or I found this solution that's kind of similar 
where it doesn't involve Houdini and 18 artists to come build this. And it'll only cost you eight, you know, uh, hour dollars. It's up to you. But yeah, I, I laughed because it immediately made me think of a swear jar. <laughs> <laughs> like every like stupid request, you, all right, put a dollar in that jar. <laughs> you just you just shake your head and and yeah. point at the jar. That I would yeah, put it in the suggestion box. It's the garbage can right over there. <laughs> I don't think they'd be around for too long if they did that. But I love that no. concept. No, I, I I think that's an interesting idea. I think what what it all boils down to. And I've been in that position, like one of the first jobs that I had in in doing 3D was for a post house that I was the only 3D artist. And I was asked to do things that I constantly was asked to do things that I didn't know how to do. And it is hard. And, and the best thing that you can do in those situations is educate people. You got to educate them. Like, I love the idea of telling them like how long, how much more t- you know, monopoly bucks that you need to do that thing. But the long-term solution should be to educate that, that client, that creative director so that they can self-regulate and they won't bring that stuff to you eventually every single time that it pops up in their head. Eventually they'll grow that muscle that says, Oh wait, I bet that's going to be hard because you told me that like modeling was the first thing we do and we already passed that and now I'm at, I'm going to I'm about to ask him to change the model that's going to be bad okay I won't ask him and I think that if you like slowly or quickly educate them as much as you can on the process and I worked with a producer that had a great way of doing this like she was amazing at educating the client as to about the process and she basically was like this is like building a house so First thing you do is drop the plans. That's the storyboard. The plans get approved. You move into uh, construction. You lay the foundation. So you're building the models. You're building the rigs. Then you're putting the drywall up and you're getting a little bit further. Then you get into lighting and that's like painting the house. And then when it's done and it's you know dressed up to be sold, that's like compositing. And so when you explain it that way and somebody goes, yeah, you know what? That thing that we started to work on, I really think it should look like Spider-Man webs. And you're like, well, that will take us, we'll have to tear down the entire house and get back to the planning stage or the foundation stage. And like when you put it in those terms, it suddenly Mm -hmm. makes people like, oh, oh, you're right. Okay, you're right. At this stage, we should be talking about this. That's such a great, that makes sense. such a great metaphor because it's literally like, okay, but you know, if you have to, if you want to move the toilet, we have to move the plumbing. Like it's a, it's a very complicated right. system. That's, that's great. I would actually, I think I'm going to start using that more. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I think it comes back to, to the original idea and, and, and maybe without the dollars, you could still essentially do, um, the, you, you, you could still allow your, your career director or your boss or whoever's proposing this stuff to pick by saying, you got it, boss here's what you're asking for and here's how much time this will take like making sure that 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 process of showing a a, um a bid or whatever you would call that like um even a storyboard saying you got it this is what this will take this will take you know this many months and and we'll have to buy this plug in (laughs) you'll have to well we'll have to do this but i think i also have a solution that has that feel that you're going for, but that won't take so long. And so I'm just going to put this on the table too, because, you know, we, I know we might not have enough time for this. And that way you're, you're coming with a, you're coming back with a solution rather than just saying like, you're being ridiculous, which they are being ridiculous sometimes, but now you're coming back and saying, um, you know, here's, here's actually a plan that gets similar to what you're going for, um, without, you know, without spending months or whatever. That's actually a great point because what you have as people that do this for a living, we are, we understand all the aspects of it. We understand how many people it takes, what kind of software you need, you know, how much time, all that sort of thing. And sometimes when somebody comes with a, with an idea, let's just keep going with this like spider thing. They might say, I want Spider-Man. 
And immediately our brains go to all of the things that I just described, all the different pieces of that puzzle, when in actuality, they might have just meant, I want it to be red. So <laughs> right. y- you you got to like say, okay, well, the, like you said perfectly, like, oh yeah, we can do that. It's going to take this many people, this many things, blah, blah, blah. But here are some things in that vein that... I wanted to get your opinion on maybe this is a a good solution. Maybe this is a good happy medium. And I love that idea of like proposing creative solutions that don't, don't kill yourself. They don't even want to kill yourself on because ultimately you don't know what they mean. They're not coming to you saying, I want all of the complexity and uh, cinematic craziness of Spider-Man in my logo. They might have just said, I love Spider-Man. Can we do something like that with my logo? And if you if you immediately jump to like, oh my God, I gotta make Spider-Man the movie for this logo, you're you're gonna go crazy. But if you just come back, like maybe it's red, maybe there's a little halftone, maybe there's a little this, you know, and find out what that means to them. And that's the other thing too. Like, dude, that's a whole other podcast. Like just getting down to what the real note is is an art form. Yeah, that's that's tough. What is the note when especially when it's abstract and it's, you know, it's missing something or it needs a pop or it's it's something here trying to figure out exactly what that means. Um, you're right. It's that's an <laughs> that's an entire art form that they don't necessarily teach you all the time in, in when you're learning software, right? Like how yep. to get a note from that client and interpret it knowing the relationship and knowing what their kind of attitude is and knowing what their tastes are. Um, and that is, are. But, Hey, we're just coming up with podcast ideas on top of podcast ideas. Mm-hmm. Let's go write that one down. Cause I, I think de- diving deeper than just at the end of this podcast would be kind of an interesting idea. And, it, and if that's something too, I loved all the feedback we got from last week. If that's something too, you want to hear, um, us talk about on a future podcast, or maybe even something a little um, in more in depth. Maybe we could dive into and kind of get into history of this stuff. Let us know in the comments. We always love hearing from you guys. Um, and uh, I, I know we're approaching we're approaching the, the longer hours. Unless there's, I think anything else. I think we could start to wrap it up and um, and uh, we'll see we'll see them in another podcast. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to say it yet, but I just wanted to clear it with you guys. How you feeling? I feel great. I feel uh, great. Yeah, we, that was a good show. I learned so much. That's how you know it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, um, I think I think that might be a good one for the next. Um, maybe not the next one, but you know we're we're trying to stay on top of this weekly uh, show. So any other ideas too that you guys are running into, um, let us know in the in the comments below. Let us know on iTunes. And can you even leave a review on uh, Spotify? I don't even know. Can we, can, I don't know, so, but you can like, follow us so you get notified when there's a new episode so you don't have to. Oh, I see why people want stuff. it on Spotify. I get it now. Yeah. I was like, why not just li- Okay, because yeah. they're in Spotify and, and you then don't you have get to, a you don't little... have to download it or anything. It's, all, it's just there. It's ready to go. It just it just reminds you, like, go, well, well hello, my, our new Spotify friends. Thank you. That finally makes sense. Thank you for listening, no matter where you're listening. Um, and, uh, appreciate your time and, and, uh, stay tuned as always. We got a big fall planned here at Grayscale Gorilla. We're always glad you're here hanging out with us, listening, learning. Hope you're making something amazing this week. And until the next show, have a good one. Keep rendering. Bye-bye everybody. Bye. Bye everybody. <laughs>